Uh, this is, promises to be a most remarkable evening. I am e one of the great pleasures of this university and of this school is the kind of uh, speaker that we'll have tonight, really one of the most important forces in the 20th century. Tonight's talk is an Albert H. Gordon lecture on finance and public policy. The lecture was established in 1987 and is a reflection of Mr. Gordon's uh, in interest in matters of finance and public policy with special attention to the internationalization of finance. Mr. Gordon, Mr. Gordon is a dedicated graduate of the Harvard class of 1923, an alumnus of the Harvard Business School. And he is the founder and former chairman of Kidder Peabody, the Kidder Peabody Company. Now, um, his having been a great friend of Harvard over the years, he's been a member of the overseers on the Committee on University Resources. He's really a quite remarkable man in so many different respects. So remarkable that he, at age 82, he ran the London Marathon. That was 24 years ago. He very much would like to be with us today, but, and he is, but via the video because he's uh, unable to be here directly. But his close friend, Mel Rines, is here with us. So welcome to both of you. Um, Mr. Gordon and Mr. Rines, welcome, and thank you very much for sponsoring us. I'm, I want to just say a couple of words before turning it over to Graham Allison to introduce our speaker. Uh, this, the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty has offered us a chance to revisit uh, this significant event and ask where we're going. And indeed, recent publicity that's raised questions about whether we couldn't do dramatically more to reduce nuclear weapons in the years to come make our speaker's appearance all the more timely uh, and, and recent events in Moscow obviously make him a timely speaker as well. Tonight, by the way, marks the third time this semester we have had a Nobel Peace Prize winner speaking here at the Kennedy School. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev's uh, prize arrived in 1990. So I want to extend a warm welcome uh, to all of those of you who are here for the Over Overcoming Nuclear Danger Conference, to the Young Global Leaders, and all the great friends. I'm now going to turn it over to Graham Allison, who is the former dean of the Kennedy School, helped to build this building and much of what you see around us. He's also the head of the Belfer Center and a distinguished professor here, Mr. Graham Allison. Thank you very much, David. Uh, this is an extraordinary evening. Uh, Fifty years from now, when the Oxford University Press uh, publishes its one-volume history of the 20th century. Only two people on earth tonight will be the subject of an entire chapter. And one of them is our guest tonight, former President Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, President Gorbachev and I were uh, discussing last night the fact that many younger students uh, even maybe some in the audience from Harvard, uh, are less familiar with the avalanche of recent history than they should be. So with his indulgence, I'm going to re re recite just a little history. When Mikhail Gorbachev became leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, the Cold War was at its height. Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, and had declared the Soviet Union to be, quote, an evil empire, close quote. Soviet air defenses had accidentally shot down a Korean airliner, KAL-007, killing 269 passengers. The hands on the doomsday clock managed by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists had moved up to three minutes to midnight. On the Harvard campus, students were calling for a nuclear freeze. Here at the Kennedy School, Joe Nye and Al Carnesale and I were co-chairing a project called Avoiding Nuclear War. Five years later, five years later, a confrontation between two superpowers that had been the centerpiece of international politics for four decades 
had been consigned to the history books. Ask yourself which single individual contributed most to the resolution without war of the Cold War. Ronald Reagan answered this question, Mikhail Gorbachev. Unlike one of his successors, Ronald Reagan had no hesitation about negotiating with leaders of countries that he judged evil. As he confided to his diary, quote, continued negotiation with the Soviet Union is essential. We need never to be afraid to negotiate, close quote. President Gorbachev was acutely aware that the Soviet system he inherited was stagnating. He undertook to reform it with policies that he called glasnost, which meant and encouraged Soviet citizens to think for themselves and to call things by their real names, as he once said. And perestroika, which meant restructuring a Soviet command and control economy. His goal was to revitalize the Soviet communist system. What he accomplished, accomplished was rather different. In the West, we honor Gorbachev for his decisive role in ending the Cold War. Indeed, in ending it with a whimper rather than the bang of a nuclear Armageddon that could have killed us all. Eastern Europeans, whose nations were members of the Warsaw Pact, are grateful that Gorbachev reversed the previous policy of his predecessors of shooting people to prevent them escaping through barbed wire fences in Hungary or over the Berlin Wall, even when that meant the unraveling of that alliance. Russian views are more complex. As a consequence of the forces that Gorbachev unleashed, in December 1991, just 16 years ago this month, the Soviet Union disappeared. In its place, there emerged a new Russia and 14 newly independent states, including Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, the Baltics. A nation that had historically been expansive shrunk back to its borders of three centuries ago under Peter the Great. Uh, two years ago, uh, President Gorbachev's 75th birthday was being celebrated in Moscow, and outside some Russian citizens were demonstrating, some of them even shouting abuses. Someone then spoke up in this group to observe to the protesters that Gorbachev was the individual who gave them the right to shout. Russia's current President Vladimir Putin has a somewhat harsher view of the recent record. He's recorded his judgment that the collapse of the Soviet Union was, quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. The strand of the story that brings President Gorbachev to Harvard tonight and tomorrow focuses on nuclear weapons. At the meeting between President Gorbachev and President Reagan in Reykjavik in 1986, the two leaders talked seriously about eliminating all nuclear weapons. Yes, I said all nuclear weapons. A year later in 1987, Gorbachev and Reagan signed the INF Treaty, zeroing out an entire class of intermediate nuclear weapons and delivery vehicles. Tomorrow, here at the school, a group of 45 policy-oriented scholars, 15 Russians, 15 Americans, 15 internationals, will spend the day with President Gorbachev exploring lessons of the successful INF Treaty for the nuclear challenges we face today, from cutting Russian and American nuclear forces to nuclear terrorism. A professor who taught me international politics when I was an undergraduate here at Harvard a long time ago, Henry Kissinger, once asked the Chinese leader, Chou Enlai, what he thought of the French Revolution. 
Chow reflected and then he said, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> About the revolutionary changes in which our guests tonight played such a decisive role, the Chinese leader's answer certainly applies. But there can be no doubt whatever that he was at the center of these storms. So it's a very great honor and pleasure to welcome back to Harvard and to this forum for the third time, former President Mikhail Gorbachev. Good evening, good evening. Uh, good evening. I see that uh, Professor Allison's uh, remarks uh, touched you so much that you decided to give me support. Thank you. No, I have to say that uh, resistance is, is, a, is a result of pressure, and I am a person who has been tested and steeled by all kinds of discussions, and I think that discussion is a normal process. I have just uh, learned uh, I was interviewed today by uh, five times, and in one of the interviews, um, the, a question was asked about perestroika, and um, I said that, well, about the impact of perestroika, uh, let me tell you a story about a French delegation visiting China. And uh, a young woman member of that delegation, um, when they were received by Chen Lai, put this question to Chairman Lai, Mr. Prime Minister, what do you think was the impact of the French Revolution on the world and on China? And without missing a beat, Chairman Lai said, well, it's too soon to tell. So that was 180 years. Uh, after the French Revolution. And as for perestroika, it has been dissected uh, many times, dismantled many times. They found a lot of elements and spare parts, and, uh, but apparently it's not yet quite clear. When I am told that the process uh, that was spurred by the changes of perestroika, that this is a process that brought some good things and some bad things, and they say that um, there are certain things that we can't accept, but nevertheless, the changes, the great turnabout, uh, is just in its early stages. I would like, uh, first of all, to greet you all who have come here. Uh, we have brought here an army of experts, both the participants in the period, during the period when we were working on these arms, arms control agreements, and also people who have dedicated their lives to studying these problems. And uh, I hope to hear a lot of interesting and new things from them tomorrow at the conference, and I'm very glad to greet you all here. I gave a special handshake uh, a few minutes ago to Ted Turner. He is a person who has been dedicating his time to these problems, who actually started doing it even before me. And I would like to welcome you all here, both the political leaders, uh, military people. There are a couple of um, uh, generals um, uh, from Russia here, very competent people. There is Ambassador Matlock here and my friends from France and others. I am very glad to see here my uh, friend, the former Prime Minister of France. As has already been said here, the reason we are here is the 20th 
anniversary of the INF treaty, which started the process of the elimination of nuclear weapons. We have gotten used to many things, but at that time, even to us, the participants in that uh, process, this was a great event, a great accomplishment that required us to exert a lot of efforts and show responsibility. But I don't think that this is a kind of jubilee meeting. I think it would be wrong to make it a jubilee meeting because there are many things today that are quite disturbing, that uh, are of concern to us, and uh, those people who have come here are still working on these same issues. They write articles, they participate in conferences, because this is still very much an issue, very much a problem. So before I start speaking about these problems, let me make some more general remarks about the state of the world today, because these problems really come into focus when we see them in the context of the world in which we are living today. And as we watch the world today, we see an acceleration of history. We see profound civilizational changes. We see, as we sometimes say, a paradigm shift. The dominant feature of the world today is globalization. We can say that we already are living in a global world. We have not yet been able to master this world. We have not yet been able to take all the opportunities and solve the problems of the global world, but we are living in a global world, and we have found particularly international politics not yet ready for this global world. And this is my reproach to policymakers but also to experts because policy not underpinned by knowledge, by science, very often is just improvisation and can be reckless. Policy making needs new knowledge and I think that perhaps we will be discussing it too and perhaps we will be able to say something that will be useful for world political leaders. In the forefront of international politics today are transnational problems and trends, such as the overload on the environment. 60% of the ecosystems are seriously damaged by men, and many of them cannot be restored. The conflict between men and the rest of nature has become a global crisis. We can say, we can say with justification that we are Даже close to the red ученых, line. In accordance with the views of some very serious scientists, we то, will not be able to, to restore all of the biosphere, Убываем much of the biosphere that we have damaged. We also see the shrinking of natural resources. We see the possibility that uh, oil and gas will soon become unavailable and uh, the problem of drinking water has become a global deficit. I think that Kofi Annan was right when he said that if you think that the, waters, the wars of the future will be about uh, oil, you're probably wrong because wars will be about water. We also see large zones of backwardness and poverty with about half the population of the world living on one or two dollars a day. So just one third of the population of mankind live in conditions worthy of human beings, but we are already at the red line as regards the environment. So in order to solve this kind of problem, to find keys to this kind of problem, it'll take a great effort. We also see chaotic financial flows. Uh, the amount of money uh, uh, in the transactions in 
any 24-hour period is up to one trillion dollars, and we see financial crises one after another. We also see dramatic changes in telecommunications. The global communication systems have a great impact on decision making. Everything becomes faster, including the movement of people and uh, products. The interaction of civilizations, whose consequences uh, I think are as yet un unknown, unpredictable, we don't know yet how this process will evolve, whether dialogue or conflict will prevail in relations between civilizations. This is a big issue. We also see the emergence of supranational political, economic and social associations such as transnational corporations, non-governmental organizations, but also crime syndicates and terrorist networks. This is also part of our world. So we are facing a very complex contradictory world and in many ways a very dangerous world, a world in which the past, the present and the future are interconnected and intertwined. Okay, let me get some water or tea because I have a cold. When I need water, I always recall my old professor from Moscow University who was uh, who taught uh, criminal procedure in the law school of Moscow University. He had a, a throat problem, as all uh, lecturers do, and when he started, he always required that there should be a glass of water, um, a jug and a glass on the lectern, and he would drink water from time to time, but one day he didn't see a jug of water, but finally uh, someone brought the water to the podium. This was a lecture for fourth year students. The professor regarded us as colleagues, and so he was our favorite professor. And so he said, colleagues, please bear in mind, even the best lecture has to be watered down. So let me water down my lecture a little bit too. In the mid-1980s, the world was facing a historical crossroads. The arms race, the build-up of weapons, and in particular weapons of mass destruction, and uh, at the same time the deadlock in relations between the nuclear superpowers created a situation that looked extremely dangerous for the world. And I recall when I was traveling in the Soviet Union at that time, people were saying one thing, do whatever you need to do, and we are even prepared to take a pay cut, but do whatever you can do to prevent nuclear war. So this situation had a big impact on the mindset of just about everyone, with some exceptions. So the question was whether there might be a conflict, and a conflict could happen not as a result of a uh, political decision, but as a result of some failure of the uh, control of the command and control system. Um, we have here among us uh, some negotiators who worked actively during that time in the nuclear arms control negotiations. But I have to say that before the mid-1980s, the arms control negotiations were becoming a kind of screen behind which the arms race continued. Uh, they were, they had, uh, I don't know how much uh, vodka and whiskey they 
uh, drank during those negotiations, but the negotiations were stalled. They were stalled for years and the process of arms control was not moving forward. In the media and among experts, various scenarios of nuclear exchanges were being discussed and we remember how this affected the situation in the world and uh, the mindset of the people and uh, nevertheless surprisingly as that may seem uh, the highest leaders of the Soviet Union and the United States had not met for six years there hadn't been a summit for six years so it was necessary to overcome the inertia of accumulated mistrust, the burden of ideological and other stereotypes and prejudices, and also the resistance of certain people on both sides, people who were committed to confrontational approaches. By the way, we have such people even now, and these are people who criticize um, the decisions that we took during those years to reduce nuclear weapons. Our meeting, our first meeting with President Ronald Reagan um, took place in Geneva in November 1985 and it was a lot more than just the first handshake. Even though we just mostly wanted to get acquainted and we were not expecting some major results. But during those two years, two days that we spent together, uh, two, I would say, 24-hour periods because we worked at night too, we really came a long way. And after the very first get-together, the very first meeting after the negotiations uh, started and we had for about an hour, a one-on-one -on -one talk in the presence only of our interpreters because he didn't speak uh, Russian, I didn't speak English, and so it was a one-on-one -on -one, but with others present. But uh, when I, uh, when that first meeting ended and I talked to my delegation, the members of my delegation asked me, what's your impression of Reagan? And I said, he's a real dinosaur. And then I learned from Newsweek magazine a week later, uh, based on some leaks from the Reagan people, Reagan was asked a similar question, what he thought about Gorbachev. And he said, a diehard Bolshevik, a really diehard Bolshevik. A real Bolshevik is a diehard Bolshevik. And nevertheless, two days after, we made a joint statement, a joint statement to our two nations and to the world. And in that statement, we said the most important thing, a nuclear war cannot be won and it must never be fought. And our two countries will not seek military superiority. At that time, that kind of statement was of enormous importance. And this became a prologue to the conceptual breakthrough that we made a year later in Reykjavik where the leaders of the Soviet Union and the United States stated their commitment to the goal of a nuclear weapon free world. In Geneva, even in Geneva, at the initiative of President Reagan, we both agreed that the ultimate goal in the process of nuclear arms control, nuclear disarmament, is to eliminate nuclear weapons. And this goal was present in all our meetings. Those of uh, the people present here who participated in those meetings, and there are some here, know that very well. Our profound disagreement with the Strategic Defense Initiative program, notwithstanding, I saw President Reagan, particularly in Reykjavik, as a person who rejects the idea of security based on the foundation of nuclear weapons. 
There was another person uh, at that time very active in international politics, and that was Margaret Thatcher. She thought that she felt very comfortable on that nuclear powder keg. And I asked her, I said, why are you happy with a powder keg, with a nuclear powder keg? She sought to explain to me, uh, to really clarify my mind on nuclear weapons. But anyway, a little more than a year after Reykjavik, we signed the INF Treaty, and I would like to pay tribute to my partners in that endeavor to President Reagan and also to George Schultz, who will be participating by video link tomorrow in our work. He wanted to come. Unfortunately, he was not able uh, to, uh, perhaps because of his age, but he has a lot to say. Two years ago, he visited uh, me in Moscow, and uh, I invited him to the Gorbachev Foundation, and when we were drinking tea, I asked him, what do you think? Could anyone else other than President Reagan do the same thing? That is to say, forget about the old prejudice and all the, that the problems accumulated in the past and act with resolve to reach an agreement with us. And after some thought, he said, no, Reagan at that time was the only person who could have done that on the U.S. side. But let me tell you very directly to Americans and Russians here that I think that I frankly don't know how President Reagan would have acted. Ambassador Matlock is listening very intently, I see. Without Secretary Schultz. Secretary Schultz was at Reagan's side and this uh, tandem was uh, of major importance and I would like to give them their due. They are and were real partners and the world should know it. At that same time we laid the foundations and by the way the media expected us, we have given them some encouragement that the negotiations were going well, we were um, doing some work even on the details of some of the agreements, but uh, the agreement was not reached because of the SDI. And uh, we said, I said at that time, that uh, given that we are reducing 50%, all the nuclear weapons, the entire triad uh, on, on land, in the air, and uh, in the seas, but we should not, at the same time, start an arms race in outer space. And so we requested, we demanded that in that treaty or in a separate treaty, we should also discuss the missile defense. And we said that we were not against SDI as a research program. We were not afraid. We said you can do research and testing on land, but not in outer space. So that was the stumbling block. And Secretary Schultz, after uh, the Reykjavik talks, spoke at the USF was base in uh, Iceland. And he called Reykjavik a failure. Uh, then, 40 minutes later, I spoke to the international media in Reykjavik and I said Reykjavik was a breakthrough because we looked over the horizon. And the next morning, Secretary Schultz learned of my statement there and he said to the media that yes, he agreed that Reykjavik was a breakthrough. I sometimes remind him of that episode, uh, which I think is useful. <laughs> so it was a difficult process, an extremely difficult process. And let me once again pay tribute to our partners because it's very important what the partners have in mind. I recall a meeting with Margaret Thatcher where I showed her a kind of chessboard 
with many, many little squares. And uh, uh, Dr. Velikov, who was present at that meeting, gave me that big chessboard with multiple squares, and those squares represented the nuclear arsenals of our two countries. And one little square, one little square was enough to undermine life on Earth. So I said to her, what else do we want if you can destroy the world once? And there were about 1,000 squares. So what do you do with 999 squares that are still there? So it was absurd to have so many weapons. Well, we understood it. So I think that without those agreements that we signed and concluded at that time, the Cold War would have been relegated to the past and we would be living in a very different world today. The final decade of the 20th century could therefore become the beginning of a new age of rapidly ridding the world of the consequences of the Cold War, of the mountains of nuclear weapons that had been piled up during the previous period, but that did not happen. I am not saying that nothing was done during that decade. Thousands of nuclear weapons were decommissioned and then destroyed. But mostly this was done in accordance with the agreements and treaties that had been reached before. There were no new steps, there were no new agreements. But there is an ineluctable law in politics. If you don't move forward, sooner or later you begin to move backwards. And unfortunately, during the 1990s, we saw that law in action. We witnessed the regressive movement from trust to mutual misunderstanding and suspicion, from interaction to geopolitical games, from joint disarmament initiatives to new weapons programs. One of the pillars of international security, the ABM treaty was cast aside. And I am particularly concerned about the re-emergence of concepts for the use of nuclear weapons, for preventive strikes, for dominance in space. One of the, and the main reason of this dangerous term was, in my opinion, the winner's complex, the victory complex that developed in the United States after the breakup of the Soviet Union. We see the symptoms of a more general and serious illness, disrespect for international law, weakening of the role of the UN Security Council and other bodies and institutions of international security. I believe that the arrogance of one great power that believes that it is capable alone to solve any problems is something that uh, is very costly. We are paying a big price already and I believe that the Americans, the US is paying a very high price for that. In the nuclear policy, we also see the remilitarization of thinking. We have to recognize that as of today, all nuclear states are basing their policy on the long-term preservation of nuclear weapons, and they're building their strategic plans on that basis. Let us discuss that tomorrow. Let us discuss what we say about this. Of course, this is not a problem that can be solved overnight. You cannot get rid of nuclear weapons overnight, but we should be moving in that direction. We should persuade policymakers with strong arguments, uh, policymakers, military leaders, we should persuade them that this is the only way to go. Instead, what we see is the erosion of the line between the political deterrence and the possibility of real use of nuclear weapons. The U.S. national security strategy of 2002 and subsequent documents declare the possibility of the use of nuclear weapons in preventive strikes as part of the so-called counter-proliferation strategy.
Russia, too, has renounced the commitment on the no first use of nuclear weapons, and there are some signs that China, too, is reconsidering that commitment. Twenty years ago, we started movement toward less reliance on nuclear weapons. Statements to this effect were made by the main protagonists in the nuclear arms race. In the 1989 London Declaration, NATO stated that nuclear weapons must become truly weapons of last resort. NATO promised to reflect it in a new strategy. Since that time, we have seen the democratic wave in Europe. The European nations are no longer enemies. And yet, on the European continent, there are still deployed U.S. nuclear weapons. The United States is the only country that has nuclear weapons deployed in territories of other countries. The militarization of politics is one of the consequences of the desire to build a unipolar world or to build a kind of monopoly on global governance. But the unipolar world, a world with one power center, has failed. So we need to go back to the model of common security to adapt this model to the new situation, to the new challenges. For this, we need a broad-based dialogue. And it is time to also have other centers, the new centers of political and economic might participate in that dialogue, and referring to China, India, Brazil, and of course an important role in this dialogue is to be played by the European Union, by Japan, by regional leaders, but nevertheless, for reasons of history, it is for Russia and the United States to take the initiative and to make a special contribution to the dialogue. And in this connection, let me uh, speak about relations between these two countries. Relations between Russia and the United States are contradictory and the trends in the political military spheres are rather adverse, but I will not characterize their relations in purely negative terms. Let me give you an interesting fact which I think will be of great importance. Whereas our countries are engaged in some rather harsh polemics, on security issues, the American corporations are working in Russia. They are developing production there. They are making money there. They sometimes have 100% uh, annual growth in Russia. Those are business leaders such as Ford, General Electric, John Deere, Boeing, which has created in Russia a big technology center where hundreds of engineers, designers, programmers, and other Russian experts work. Boeing also cooperates with the Sukhoi Corporation and in this way helps to rebuild Russia's aircraft industry. And those are not just single examples. In fact, the economic foundation of U.S.-Russian relations is being built for the 21st century. But those relations could again be undermined, damaging both sides, if we do not find solutions to the difficult problems that we're facing in the arms control and security area. And among those problems, I believe that the missile defense problem is central. If we find solution to the ABM problem, if we combine the interests and approaches of both nations, then we'll have a positive effect that will impact both the political military sphere and other spheres of our relations. If we fail, then we will jeopardize the very possibility of constructive interaction with all the consequences for peace and security. So far as we are concerned, uh, a lot of different assessments and viewpoints are being expressed in Russia about this, and certain decisions are being taken.
The United States and Russia still have the largest, by far the largest, nuclear arsenals. Those two countries, together with other nuclear weapons nations, assumed an obligation of Article 6 in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the obligation to negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons. Those countries are capable of resuming the nuclear arms reduction process, speeding that process, making it irreversible, and reaching a minimum level, and from that minimum level, move toward the goal of a nuclear weapon-free world. As a person who is committed to this goal today, as much as yesterday, I would like to express my gratification at the fact that this goal is once again at the center of public attention as a result of the publication of the articles by George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, William Perry and Sam Nunn. As a result of that article, as a result of their initiative, the idea of a nuclear weapon-free world is once again on the agenda. Let me tell you, by the way, that according to a representative opinion poll, that was conducted by an American university here in this country. In the United States, 82% of the population support the goal of a nuclear weapon free world. In Russia, according to that same poll, uh, the number of such supporters is more than 60%. And therefore, you know, when uh, people uh, try to justify uh, the weapons race uh, by the will of the people, well, that is something that can't be accepted. Of course, we are realists. We understand that we can only move toward that goal step by step. And our number one task is to overcome the consequences of the uh, stagnation and regression of the past 15 years. We need to restore the momentum of the negotiations. We need to identify those areas where early agreement can be achieved. We need to clarify how to adapt the existing agreements, including verification systems, to the new circumstances. And one of our first goal, I believe, one of our first tasks, I believe, is certainly saving the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We have to understand that the use of force and the use of force talk about which emerges again and again from time to time could only aggravate the situation. Indeed, the first successes in the negotiations with the uh, North Korean government show that the political approach and the diplomatic efforts do yield results. In this context, uh, our conference, I believe, should discuss the situation that has emerged in the negotiations on the Iranian nuclear problem, also in the light of the most recent information that became available yesterday and today. The deadlock in these negotiations prompts the following question. Was the correct tactic chosen from the very start? Iran is being presented with the demands that are not presented to other non-nuclear nations. That is to say, to renounce the full nuclear fuel cycle, that is to say, renounce uranium enrichment. But was there an alternative, such as developing a set of incentives that would apply to all non-nuclear participants in the non-proliferation treaty? Of course, I am putting this question for discussion, but this is not a purely historical question, because the answer to this is important for developing subsequent steps. The Non-Proliferation Treaty is a rather special treaty. Frankly, it is not a very equitable treaty. Most of its participants renounce nuclear weapons, whereas the members of the nuclear club keep those weapons for an indefinite period of time. The longer that period, the less, the less trust and the greater risk 
to this regime. So we need a step that would put all countries in equal position, in an equal position that would restore trust in the current possessors of this absolute weapon. I believe, I am confident, that this step must be the ratification by nuclear powers of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, because this is a treaty that puts one restriction, one blanket restriction on all its participants, and that would ease, at least to some extent, the concerns regarding the behavior of the current nuclear powers. It would create a kind of moral and political pressure on those nuclear powers that would refuse to sign or ratify that treaty. I am convinced that should the United States and Russia take the first step, others will not be able, will find it very difficult to stand aside. Recently, the United States and Russia have declared their intention to reach an agreement to replace the START-1 treaty that will expire at the end of 2009. It is good that in that statement, the two sides recalled their obligation in Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But I don't see a negotiating process actually happening, and there is reason to believe that these negotiations could be very long. The change in the political leadership of the two countries could result in a pause for reassessment of the situation, and the result could be that another very important pillar of the arms control system could fall. And in, under these circumstances, the responsibility of the current two presidents is very great. Let us urge them, we have a right as experts, as knowledgeable people, and I am sure that this knowledge will be shown tomorrow, we have a right to urge them to conclude a political agreement on the preservation in effect of all the main provisions of the START Treaty, including, and that's of fundamental importance, of the system of verification and inspection up until the moment of the conclusion of a new treaty. And I believe that the successors to the two presidents will not be able, will not want, actually, to reject such an agreement. Of course, I also support the recent call of Russia and the United States to countries that have intermediate range and shorter range missiles to join the INF Treaty. But at the same time, we have to understand that reaching this goal will take time. There will be difficulties, but these difficulties should not be used as a pretext for the withdrawal from the INF Treaty. If a country, two or five countries, has some kind of weapon, that doesn't mean that all countries should have such weapons. Such a demand would be ludicrous. So let me emphasize once again, we cannot live on old capital for an indefinite period of time. All of the things that I have mentioned, including the non-proliferation treaty, the unratified comprehensive test ban treaty, START 1, INF, all of these treaties were concluded by the previous generations of political leaders. It's very important to make sure that the new presidents of the United States and Russia have available to them a conceptual basis and specific proposals for a new agreement, for new agreements. These new agreements cannot be a simple extrapolation of the existing agreements because too much has changed in the world over the past decades. And therefore, the role of the expert community is even greater. The expert community is very well represented here at this conference, and I believe that the expert community is capable to produce the analysis of the situation of the changes and to produce proposals for the political leaders.
Let us take, for example, the problem of verification and inspections. It is totally wrong to declare that this system is obsolete and unnecessary after the end of the Cold War. It is totally wrong to say that while our countries now trust each other and therefore we don't need any verification or inspection, let's just take their word for it. Well, we know what it is to take their word for it. We have seen that so far as promises about NATO non-enlargement are concerned, etc. So verification is of fundamental importance. I remember how our American partners who are present here, um, Ambassador Matlock, who was responsible in the State Department for Russia and Eastern Europe and then was ambassador in the Soviet Union, they were always emphasizing verification. And I remember how American partners were saying that to us again and again. And I remember once saying to them, yes, we need arms control treaties and we need a verification system. And let me assure you, we will demand verification. And then we'll see what your real attitude toward verification is. And this is exactly what happened. And today we're still persuading the United States of the need for a verification system. This could be one of the points that we need to discuss. We cannot allow the system of verification to fall apart. It is falling apart. There is still the Open Skies Treaty. Our countries have not renounced that Open Skies Treaty. That's very important. It's a very important treaty. But under current conditions, the Verification system, the confidence building system should probably be adapted, adjusted because of financial reasons and also we need a new combination of intrusive verification measures and softer verification measures. We also need to involve other countries in the verification system. There is another very serious issue that uh, has been left out of negotiations and that is preventing an arms race in space preventing weaponization in space. We need to find a new approach that on the one hand will assure the security of legitimate space activities, including military activities such as communications, sensing, etc., but at the same time guarantee non-aggressive, non-offensive nature of such space activities. And I suggest that as one of the results of our conference, we should create a joint working group of experts to prepare specific proposals for the political leadership of the United States and Russia and then other countries as well. This group could discuss all the problems and issues that we will raise at this conference and then bring in experts in various areas to develop these new proposals. I am sure that this will be a very good thing that we could do. I would be ready, together with George Schultz and others, other gentlemen, uh, to participate in this work and in effect, this will, would be the continuation of the initiative of the four, and uh, I am ready to take part, too. Now, I would like also to take this opportunity in order to raise another issue that I believe should become a subject of active interaction between the United States and uh, Russia, including interaction at the highest level. In the early 1990s, among the problems on which we set up working groups, uh, President Bush and I decided to set up working groups, were the so-called transnational problems, such as the environment, fighting terrorism, fighting epidemics, but later this working group mechanism stopped working systematically, but I think that we now have more such problems and therefore we should again recreate this kind of working group on transnational 
problems. We need to reactivate, to re-energize U.S.-Russian contacts on all problems. This is very important to build confidence and also for a kind of common intellectual work. We have the kind of intellectual potential in our countries that can generate ideas and initiatives that would prevent, preempt the emergence of new threats. But of course, in the final analysis, it is the political leadership that is the most important thing. But of course, political leadership should be based on knowledge and on very full and persuasive information. I am confident that there will be leaders in the global world of the 21st century, the leaders whom we must help with our knowledge, with our experience, we should support them in fighting the forces of inertia, and I am sure that we can do that. Sometimes people call me an idealist. But I regard myself as an optimist. Thank you. So after after such a comprehensive. Uh, overview and introduction to many of the topics that we're going to spend uh, the whole day tomorrow uh, wrestling with. Uh, I'm certainly going to resist the temptation to make a comment or ask a question, but let me explain how the rules work. Stand up at the microphones. There are two here on the ground floor and there are two in the loges. Uh, the rules, uh, as David Elwood often states them, are sh short question, ends with a question mark, and start by introducing yourself. And let's begin here, please. So, uh, okay, we have clear recommendations from Dr. Allison. So my name is Charles Osagano. I'm a MPA student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is, if you were the president of Russia right now, what would you be doing differently? Well, I don't reply to such questions. Recently, when uh, I was visiting with Margaret Thatcher, uh, it was last spring, I came to London to congratulate her on her 80th birthday. She was in high spirits, and uh, then she asked me this question. Mikhail, uh, do you sometimes still want to be in charge? I said, no, I wouldn't. I've had enough. But she said, but I would. No, I don't want to be in charge. That's to your question as well. The, the last time President Gorbachev was here, somebody asked the question. Last time, when President Gorbachev was here, he asked a hypothetical question. Which the question was, well, what would have happened if, instead of Kennedy being assassinated, Khrushchev had been assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald? He would have been the same Lee Harvey Oswald. And President Gorbachev thought for a little bit President and he said, said he didn't think that Aristotle Onassis would have married Mrs. Khrushchev. I'm from China. I'm currently a student in Kennedy School of Government. Back in 1985, your administration carried out a famous economic reform, um, Billiest Loiga, consists of a series of new law and regulations. Including law on cooperatives 
and Soviet Union, uh, Soviet joint, Soviet joint venture law, which permit private partnership, eliminate oh. international trade monopoly, and jo allows joint venture, and so on. Тогда были был принят новый закон о собственности, были разрешены совместные предприятия, потом ушла монополия внешней торговли и так далее. And around the same time, China underwent Deng Xiaoping's economic reform with uh, open-door policy. Тогда же примерно начались экономические реформы Дэн Сяопина и политика открытых дверей в Китае. The two reforms share similar origins and features, but had different effects and impact on each country. Много общего в двух реформах, но результаты и последствия для двух стран очень разные. So, would you please? Share with you saw tonight about like uh, you thought on the reasons and the root cause for the difference. Не могли бы вы сказать, почему на ваш взгляд такое большое различие, в чем причины такого большого развития в результатах? Спасибо. Я думаю, что Китай и Советский Союз в то время были две большие страны. Были две разные страны. Если не будем знать и не будем это видеть, if we don't see that, случае, if we don't see that difference, then I think we could uh, make the kind of mistakes that were made in our country after the breakup of the Soviet Union, when uh, uh, we in Russia rather mechanically, with the help of some of our friends from Harvard, from Harvard, wanted to. Uh, implement a, a new kind of neoliberal approach to reforms. In China, you should do the reforms the Chinese way, in Russia, the Russian way. In France, the French way. Particularly in France, the French way. <laughs> and I'm sure that the former Prime Minister of France agrees. Uh, my name is George Elfond. I'm a first year MPAD student. And I have to apologize to the audience, but I would like to ask this question in Russian. Уважаемый Михаил Сергеевич, во-первых, позвольте поприветствовать вас от лица русскоговорящих студентов Гарварда и поблагодарить вас за выступление здесь. И я бы хотел спросить у вас. Какое ваше видение на политические процессы, происходящие сейчас в соседних республиках с Россией, таких как Украина и Грузия? Okay, the, the question is um, uh, what President Gorbachev thinks about the political processes currently underway in uh, some of the former Soviet republics, such as Ukraine and Georgia. Я думаю, что все после. Well, I think that the entire uh, post-Soviet space is undergoing a process, a process of post-Soviet democratic transition. And um, as regards each of those republics, each of those states, they have their own unique features that have to be borne in mind. If you look at the Baltic states, uh, the former Baltic republics of the Soviet Union, there's one approach. If you look at Kazakhstan and Central Asia, a totally different approach. I believe that in Kazakhstan the process is going on quite successfully. Although Nazarbayev has been criticized for uh, authoritarianism. As for Georgia, of course, uh, that republic underwent a lot of change, a lot of upheaval, and all the problems. Uh, that they are facing emerged even before Shevardnadze returned to Georgia and despite Shevardnadze's experience he was not able to get the situation in hand and to create a project that would unite all Georgians, that would unite Georgia and you know how it ended. You cannot 
Революция Рос. Attribute all the problems to the Rose Revolution. Навязанная откуда-то. You cannot say that the Rose Revolution was imposed from abroad. You cannot say that the Orange Revolution was imposed. Yes, certainly there was some involvement. All kinds of nations were involved. We were involved in others. But it is the domestic, the domestic situation in, the, in those countries. It is the forces and movements that had taken shape that actually determined the course of events. Uh, the fact that in Ukraine just about everyone wanted Kuchma's rule to end is a fact. The fact that Shevardnadze too uh, was no longer popular and that he, he didn't have uh, enough popularity to be able to solve those problems is also a fact. So I think that what we need is to after these 16 years and after all of the diverse experience of all of those years, after, you know, we have uh, had some bumps, big bumps and to smaller bumps, and after all of this, based on our experience, we should now move on. We should not worry about the criticism that we sometimes hear in the West to when they criticize us for setbacks to democracy. Uh, recent congresses of political scientists uh, have stated that there have been a setback, a global setback to the democratic process in just about every country which we praised for ousting authoritarian and dictatorial regimes in many of those countries, there are now other leaders, but uh, their style is rather authoritarian. This is because the democratic forces, the democratic bodies and institutions have been unable to solve the problems that affect those societies. Every country has its own history. Every country has its own experience. Every country has its own culture. And if we hope to be able to instill democracy by um, distribu distributing it like instant coffee to all nations or by bringing it on the back of tanks and uh, navy ships, we will fail. Democracy should grow on the country's own soil. I think this is happening. And, of course, Georgia is part of this process, but you also have, of course, the ethnic problems and uh, the division of the Georgian society and of Georgia as part of the difficulties that that country faces. I think they missed the moment in Georgia when they could have solved the problem by a constitution based on a federation, a federation that would give a lot of autonomy to the um, various regions of Georgia within uh, one state. But they missed that moment. And uh, right now, I think uh, that federation solution is no longer available. And when the Georgian friends say to the Abkhaz that um, uh, they should accept the constitution adopted in 1929, they hear a very simple answer. The Abkhaz say, we live in accordance with the constitution adopted in 1920. We are older than you are as an independent nation. So, time and more understanding of these problems and of the fact that these problems should be addressed based on all of the factors that I've mentioned. They cannot be solved by force. They cannot be solved by selling, by, by buying the elites, the establishment. 
that'll fail. You know my special attitude toward Georgia. I have always been um, very sympathetic to them. I come from the Caucasus myself, and I know very well all that has been happening there. Chechnya was a neighbor of the Stavropol region where I worked for many years, so I know the situation quite well there as well. So let us not interfere with the democratic process. And the democratic process will ultimately bring answers to the difficult issues that we are facing. Again, going back to those congresses of political scientists, they said that it's entirely possible that the 21st century would be a century of authoritarianism. Well, let's not be very surprised about some authoritarianism that we see in our countries because change is difficult, but we need change. Thank you, Mr. Gorbachev. Uh, Josh Zagorski, Harvard College freshman. It has been rumored that Russia sold uh, nuclear technology to Iran. Without any idealism and speaking completely realistically, 100 years from now, how many countries and how many groups do you think will possess nuclear weapons and what will Russia have done to increase or decrease this number? Были случаи, что Россия продавала какие-то ядерные технологии Ирану, но если вот задать вопрос в духе полного реализма, как вы думаете, через сто лет какое количество стран или организаций будут иметь ядерное оружие, и что может сделать Россия для того, чтобы повлиять на этот процесс в положительную или отрицательную сторону? Well, Russia alone cannot do anything. This is our common task. This is the task of the entire world community. That's my first point. My second point, if this process, if such processes in nuclear policy continues the way it has been going over the past years, then it's very difficult to say what uh, will be happening a hundred years from now and whether mankind will survive these hundred years because the spread of nuclear weapons creates a situation where a technical failure in the command and control systems could precipitate a war, but of course it also makes it possible for terrorists to get a hold of nuclear weapons, and therefore our approach should be, first of all, to implement all of the agreements that are in effect, and also if there is a need for improving those treaties, we should do that, but at the same time we should be moving toward the goal of reading the world of nuclear weapons. Not overnight, not quickly, but we should move toward that goal. And much will depend on the United States and Russia. Once again, let me make that point. Hi, my name is Tufik Rahim. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, you alluded to in your talk uh, uh, to the national uh, intelligence assessment uh, regarding uh, Iran, and I wanted to probe a little bit further what do you feel are the underlying intentions and motivations of the United States in its policies towards Iran? And how do you feel or how can the tensions rising between Iran and the United States be diffused so that we can avert another war in the Middle East? Вы упомянули последнюю новость относительно разведной оценки Ирана, которая была опубликована вчера. В этой связи я хочу задать такой вопрос. В чем вы видите причины политики поведения США в отношении Ирана и что можно сделать для того, чтобы избежать военного конфликта, еще одного конфликта на Ближнем Востоке? Well, I wouldn't really uh, assume the responsibility of formulating uh, a, you know, a full reply to your question. But I do have opinions about this, of course. I think that uh, after the Cold War, we lost our way. The world lost its way. 
There were possibilities for real cooperation in a world without the Cold War. But we were smart enough, wise enough, or not smart enough to even allow a war to happen in the middle of Europe, the bombing of Yugoslavia. And uh, terrorism, an explosion of terrorism, that too happened for a reason, for certain reasons. Those who think that the problem of terrorism can be solved by weapons is mistaken, greatly mistaken. Terrorism is a reaction, or rather, terrorists use the reaction to the humiliation of whole nations. There are certain nations that have been sidelined, totally marginalized in the world, and people don't want to put up with it. When I said that half the population of the world lives on a dollar or two a day, I would say that hundreds of millions of people out of that half the population of the world live in total misery and poverty, and I believe that this is fertile ground for recruiting terrorists. So these problems must be addressed. So there is, I think, uh, an entire set of issues that needs to be addressed. And I think that should be the priority in terms of what you mentioned. We certainly need, once again, to go back to almost square one, uh, square one, that is to say the point where we were at the end of the Cold War, when we announced the end of the Cold War, when we adopted the Charter of Paris, when we started to reconsider the military doctrines, and we must start building a new world order. We have seen a globalization that is a kind of blind process, a, a, a process that aggravates all problems and that makes problems even worse, and that um, actually creates new problems. When we were conducting a research project on globalization at the Gorbachev Foundation and I visited the Middle East, Middle Eastern scholars and politicians laughed at me. They said, what kind of globalization do we have? We just have colonialism. We have Americanization. They said, are you naive? And those were people who uh, were close, very close to President Mubarak and others. Uh, other leaders of the Middle East. So this is the situation. This is how the situation is seen from there. The world has been divided. The Islamic world is being blamed for terrorism. But what we need is to understand the Islamic world, to understand the messages, the signals that come from the Islamic world. Of course, the Islamic world should adapt itself, should adjust. Of course, we should help them to adjust. It should be an organic part of the global process. Globalization should have a human face. Globalization should not be a one-way street. So, and a similar approach to the other problems. So, my answer is we should step by step build a new world order an order in which we should have some governance. Yesterday, in one of the interesting conversations that I had uh, with a very interesting person, I heard uh, a remark that, well, uh, the United Nations is not really measuring up. And I asked him, why is the United Nations not measuring up? Maybe because uh, there was a lack of financing for that organization and Ted Turner had to pitch in and to put a lot of his own money into saving the UN. 
How can we hope that the process will be normal if international law is no longer respected, if international law is cast aside so easily, and uh, nations behave on the basis purely of their own interests and considerations? With a chaos like this, with disrespect for international law and international institutions, you can't expect anything positive in the world to happen. And even the most powerful weapons, even the most smart missiles will not save us. I'll be speaking in both languages. Um, Сегодня я представляю организацию Гарвардского русских студентов, называется Рожденный в СССР. Русских студентов. Русских студентов в Гарварде, Рожденный в СССР. И у нас такой вопрос. Вы не сожалеете, что страна, в которой, в которой мы родились, больше не существует? И почему? Um, today I'm representing a Russian organization called Born in SSR, and our question is, um, are you, um, do you regret that the country that we are both were born in uh, doesn't exist anymore, and why? Ну вот сожалеете ли вы о распаде Советского Союза, страны, где, как она говорит, она родилась, где вы родились, и почему распалась эта страна? <laughs> well, I certainly was born in the USSR. And uh, it would uh, take me a lot of time to fully reply to your question, but I'll try to be brief. Among the problems that uh, we faced and that we had to address as part of perestroika, as part of our reforms, was the problem of reforming, of reshaping our union state. Reforming, I emphasize, based on, as we thought, based on decentralization, because we already were seeing the signs of disintegration. If we don't decentralize, we saw the possibility of disintegration. And by the way, if you read uh, uh, the constitutions adopted under Stalin and under Brezhnev, you will see that the Union Republics were declared to be sovereign states, states that have sovereignty and the right to secession, the right to self-determination up to and including secession. So, of course, nothing anti-constitutional happened, but it happened against the will of the people, because the people spoke in a referendum in 1991 for preserving the Union, and this referendum was held at my proposal, because I said that we cannot decide the fate of our country just among leaders. I said it's for the people to decide. The people supported the continuation of the Union, but then the process evolved and we, the supporters of Perestroika, acted too late to reform, to reshape the Union, and then those who felt that they were impinged after the free elections, that they saw that their time was almost over after the free elections, they saw no prospect within a democratic country, within free elections, and there was a big battle, a big battle within the party and within our society and also within our multi-ethnic state. There were some people who took advantage of that situation, who exploited that situation, just like, you know, in Paris and France, we see people who demonstrate uh, in the suburbs, they uh, want their problems to be addressed, but then some others, some people who provoke uh, fighting, join in the protest, and so they set houses and cars on fire, etc. So we had a kind of similar situation, and when we started to 
speed up that process of reforms, process of change. There were certain people, including people close to me, who didn't like the treaty that we had prepared, that we were to sign on the 20th of August. They organized a coup against that new union treaty, against that new union treaty on the 19th of um, August. They wanted to scuttle a new union treaty, and this is what they did. Khrushchev, now deceased, uh, the chairman of the KGB, said we need to act in order for that treaty not to be signed. Then Yeltsin did a similar thing after another union treaty had been developed and was ready for signing. And so we all as Russians, let's call all of our so Russians, we, the Russians, all of us are to blame for this happening. I believe that this is the biggest failure in my political career, but I still believe that the Union could have been preserved. And now we must uh, move along the path of perhaps uh, taken by the countries that now form the European Union. We should develop uh, integration particularly economic integration, trade integration, and the new states should become stronger, should become truly independent, because if we try once again to force them into the Union, and if we jeopardize their sovereignty, then this will fail, this will not be possible. I was supporting a very important project among uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia to create a common economic space, a common economic space. And uh, actually there were many decisions taken in that direction. But then when Yushchenko became president, that process was scuttled. A common economic space of those nations would account for 80% of the economic might, of the economic potential of the former Soviet Union. 220 million population. It would have become a good partner to the European Union. You cannot create a truly united Europe if you only build it from the West. You should build it also from the East. Our friends who are in Paris, and I'm again uh, referring to the presence of the um, former French Prime Minister, our friends from Italy, uh, Mr. Chiesa, Mr. Demichelis, I think our friends in uh, Italy and in France perhaps overestimate their role in the creation of the European Union. The European Union is a great achievement of the people of the European Union, but the European Union of the 27 would never have happened without perestroika, without freedom in Central and Eastern Europe, freedom of choice. So who made the biggest contribution? Well, certainly all the Europeans contributed to the European Union, but at this stage, at this early stage, without the changes in the Soviet Union, the Europe of today would have continued to be a Europe of six or seven or eight nations. So we need to build Europe, a united Europe, from the West and from the East, and we need integration that would create a common space. And this, I think, will once again produce possibilities for integration in the former Soviet space. Uh, there are certain integration processes underway there, but not yet in the decisive parts of the post-Soviet area. So, I urge you to go back and uh, to create associations there. I think, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, with the, that answer and apologies to the other people who are up, к сожалению, мы должны извиниться перед the, uh, другими желающими hour. задать вопросы, но видение 
I, I wanted to, uh, to uh, say to our audience tonight, uh, for one second, that we have an extraordinary group of conferees here, several of them... Um, um, the President says, let, let me take the initiative here and let me suggest that we allow uh, one person from each of the groups here to ask one final question. One brief question. <laughs> so please, introduce yourself and be brief. Okay. It's such an honor to, to be able to have a dialogue with you today, Mr. Gorbachev. Uh, my name is Carol, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School, and I'm from China. Um, as you just mentioned, China and um, Russia adopted two very different uh, approach to political and economic reform. Uh, Russia went with like, the Big Bam, uh, while China went with the more gradual uh, reform, which follow like Marx's, you know, building the sound economic base before approaching uh, political reform. What do you think of China's uh, socialist system with Chinese characteristic uh, today? And what advice do you have for China regarding moving towards more uh, political reform? Well, first of all, I believe that whatever the Chinese do, I want China to remain stable. And I am sure that we will forgive you a lot of things if you do. We really don't want upheaval in China. God, God forbid. But I believe it is the responsibility of all international community to have cooperation with China and in this way to contribute to its harmonious integration in the world. And this is the best approach. China has to be cautious in what it does. All the others have to be prudent as well. And I think a lot of interesting things are happening in China. Uh, let me tell you that for 12 years they never published a single book of mine in China. <laughs> but in uh, the past couple of years they have published 10 of my books. So I think they are coming closer to the moment. I think they are coming closer to the moment when they will be addressing the political issues and the political reforms. But I believe that they will continue to preserve the role of the Communist Party in China. Здравствуйте, Михаил Сергеевич. Меня зовут Юлия, я студентка второго курса. Просто хотела спросить, что вы думаете о результатах выборов, которые прошли в России два дня назад? The question is, what do you think about the results of the elections in Russia? Мне тут я могу коротко сказать, все ясно было. Well, very briefly, what what happened was what was to be expected. It was very clear. What? And now we are coming to the second phase of this process. United Russia has power. Vladimir Putin really rescued them. Putin came to their help, but now United Russia must uh, um, answer you know, all of the, to all of the commitments that they took to the people. If they are able to fulfill those obligations and commitments, then we'll applaud them. If not, you know what happens. Please. Oh, my name is Andrew Ignatov. I am from Ukraine and I am a student at the Kennedy School of Government. I uh, would like to ask you... I'm sorry? Um, I, I would like uh, to ask you about uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, nuclear disarmament. 
1991, after the people of Ukraine supported it independent over independence overwhelmingly Ukraine uh, gave up its nuclear weapons and enormous amount of uh, nuclear weapons were shift, uh, shipped uh, to Russia uh, in, ret in return Ukraine got uh, some uh, provisions uh, uh, based on international law from uh, the international community including the Russian Federation do you think Oh, well, this uh, provisions included uh, ter territorial integrity uh, um, or the guarantees for territorial integrity and guarantees for sovereignty from the international community. Do you think that the model of nuclear disarmament that Ukraine, Russia and international communities, uh, international community uh, worked out at that time is something that could be applied um, in other situations? Thank you. Well, I believe that this model is absolutely right and absolutely appropriate, and I think that it worked very well. Russia has been on the side of Ukraine and is on the side of Ukraine. Presidents and prime ministers come and go in Russia and in Ukraine. But the Russians and the Ukrainians remain. And this is the most important thing. Uh, and of course it's your responsibility to make sure that Ukraine doesn't fall apart. Mikhail Sergeyevich, my name is Liza Konoplyova. I'm a Boston College student, uh, political science, and my question is about your reaction to the recent conflict that arose between the two nations because of the Bush administration's decisions to position uh, weapons relatively near Russia in order to prevent an attack or counteract an attack from Iran, a possible attack. Uh, do you have any criticisms of, of Putin's reaction to it or do you have any uh, or do you approve? Well, uh, well, I will take advantage of your question and take it more broadly. I have to say that I am astonished at quite a few things in U.S. foreign policy. Военный... <laughs> The U.S. military budget is at the highest is at the highest level, higher than during the height of the Cold War. I really don't know who the United States intends to go to war with. No one wants to go to war with the United States. But Americans are, America gets ready. So that's, of course, up to you to sort out. Uh, years ago at Camp David, I gave President Bush a map that was given to me by our intelligence services and that map showed U.S. military bases in various parts of the world. When we met next time, he said the map is correct. I said, well, that means that our intelligence is doing a fairly good job. Later, they started to close down some of those bases. But what is happening now? They are building new bases. And all of the, this mostly around oil and gas. So the question is, who needs the current 120 military U.S. bases in the world. I, 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 I,
отдает милитаризации. And as I've uh, recently said, uh, it, it looks like there is a militarization on the way in the U.S. But if that is so, that's a kind of disease. I think the United States of America, even изменив сотрудничество, принципы сотрудничества с другими странами, на принципе партнерства, а не давления и командования, стать, возглавить многие процессы, быть лидером. I think the United States of America has the potential to be a world leader, but it should be a leadership based on cooperation and partnership with other countries, rather than on force and on imposition. Well, I probably said more than you wanted. Certainly, those are, above all, America's issues. We respect America. We respect what America has achieved, what Americans have built on their land. And, uh, of course, that's the right approach, because it would be wrong not to give Americans their due. Меняющиеся политические элиты должны понять, что никто уже в мире не собирается ходить в форваторе. On the other hand, um, the changing uh, political elites here in this country should understand that the world will not be just a follower no, of the United no, States. But as for building so partnership with the United States, I would say with few exceptions, just about every country in the world wants to be a partner to the United States. So let us wish that the Americans themselves find the right solutions. Thank you. We, we go. You will not be saying anything else. That's it. That's it. Uh, let's say again how happy we are to have President Gorbachev here and how much we look forward to his next visit. Thank you.